um, thank you very much for your submissions. I think this is, and for, and for taking the time to come before us, and Alison, you're welcome. Um, we have scrutinised what's been happening, obviously, and I think this is hugely timely and urgent and worrying for many aspects, and I think we all share that concern, and you've outlined it in your, um, in your submissions as well. Uh, there's common denominators against across all the witnesses that we talk to around what's happening at the moment in terms of the, the erosion of very basic human rights and the impact of Brexit and the legislation that's trying to be put through, whether it be the protocol legislation or the legacy leg legislation. I was looking back on your the report that you did in uh, 2011 um, from the Joint Committee in particular, and my first question would be around them. The Good Friday Agreement and the Joint Declaration set out uh, to establish a Charter of Rights uh, for the island of Ireland. Um, and you obviously examined that in the report that you did in 2011, and you outlined some very constructive next steps to be taken uh, to finalise the context of a Charter of Rights for the Island of Ireland. Of Ireland. I want to ask you um, where that's at at the moment, and what role do um, the Irish government and the British government still have to play in relation to that? So that's... My first question would okay. be. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Conway. Um, and perhaps um, I'll just answer as much as I can, and mm -hmm. Ali might jump in if she has anything to add on this. But as Ali mentioned, she's the youngest, as she put it, the three of us, all three of us have started in the last mm -hmm. two years or two and a half years. Um, so obviously that is a, historically just before our term of office. Um, as you say, the Charter of Rights was set out in um, the Good Friday Agreement as, as something that the Joint Committee would pursue. And at the time, there have been, I would describe, a couple of bursts of activity towards that, if you like. Um, and although that was set out as something that could be pursued in, that, in the 2011 report, really the focus uh, since then has been, and right up to um, the, the, between 2016 and 2020 in particular, around the implications of Brexit. So it has not progressed in any meaningful way, is my direct answer to you on that. Um, I think it's a, 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 a point in time at which it, it could be, and always could be, reviewed and looked at again. Um, I have to say, though, I, I think the priority is and, and should be right now um, the dedicated mechanisms, the work of those units. Um, but it's absolutely something that we can explore. I might just suggest that the team can follow up with you just to document exactly where within the intervening 11 years, obviously since that report has been issued, Deputy, uh, where that work has um, happened and, and anything uh, you know, more than that. But really, as I say, it has not advance, advanced in any, in any meaningful way. And I don't know, Ali, if you'd like to add anything to that. Um, simply, I think, to say that the Commission's position, as far as I'm aware anyway, hasn't changed since then. Yeah. Um, so it's still there. It's for others now to accept or reject it. Um, I don't think it's been either accepted or rejected. It's just sort of parked, to use that word again. Um, so it's up to others, I think, now. Yeah. Okay. If I may just add to that, uh, the Equality Commission wasn't party to that report. But Northern Ireland has been going through a process of trying to do some work at assembly level in relation to a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, and unfortunately that work is parked. But we've all given evidence to that ad hoc committee. Uh, we very much are of the view that uh, rights should not be diminished, but should be strengthened, and there is a role for a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland. Thank you for that. I would really appreciate it if you might, with the indulgence of the Chair, if, if you might... Um, give us a, a, a synopsis of that, sure. of where things are at, and any suggestions that you might have, particularly in relation to submissions that we could make to the Irish government in the part uh, that they need to play to move that on. Because what we're finding is in many of the challenges that we're facing now, had all of the agreements been fully implemented, then many of the, the, the problems that we're facing now um, would be null and void. And we are the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement Committee, and we have a responsibility to make sure all of it is implemented. So that would be really useful. I appreciate that. Uh, am, am I okay for time, Pauline, for the moment? Um, the Legacy Bill, obviously, um, is, is of huge concern uh, to us. 
and the need for that legacy bill to be withdrawn for many of the reasons that you outlined uh, in, in your submission. Um, do you think that if the legacy bill is to go ahead, um, the Irish government will have any choice um, but to take an interstate case to Europe against the British government? Because there is so much wrong, there's so much detrimental about this bill. Could I ask you just to comment on that? Um, I don't have a, a, an immediate comment from the Commission on that. I'm going to ask Ali to answer on uh, the Legacy Bill because she is, amongst the three of us, the prominent expert in this particular area. Um, but we as a Commission, I'm, I'm a chair of a 15-member Commission, um, have not got an exact position on what an Irish government response could and should be in the event that such a bill is progressed. So I'd like to ask Ali, and again, I'd be happy to follow up with you, Deputy, on anything else. Okay. Yes, um, how you concluded your question is probably the most relevant point, is that if everything had been implemented, um, this probably wouldn't have any potential at all um, to pass through. Um, and w when you asked about the Charter of Rights for the Ireland of Ireland, that of course is different to the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. We would say the Bill of Rights is still an unfulfilled commitment in Northern Ireland and it has its own very specific place and purpose. Um, and that was agreed by the special committee set up to look at it, but it just couldn't be agreed in, in, in its content. But anyway, going back to the legacy bill, um, it's troubling in, um, its, in all its parts and the temptation to try and fix it bit by bit to make it uh, approach something which is acceptable in human rights terms. Um, it, it is very tempting, but it's simply not possible. Um, and I'm not answering this, as I'm not being asked as a politician, I'm not being asked as a representative of any group or, or society generally. I'm being asked as a Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission whether this is compatible with human rights standards as they are at the moment. And my very clear, strong advice and that of my colleagues in Northern Ireland is that it is not. So it's not really for us to say you could make it compliant potentially because we do not see simple fixes to this. Uh, and by starting to offer amendments, I think we get into the territory of just, just making it even more messy. It is so fundamentally um, different to the state's obligation under the European Convention that I can't really take that any further at all. Um, you ask specifically um, about an interstate case. That's, that's not really for me, um, to, probably even to comment on or even try to influence, but clearly that is a possibility that is available. Um, it may be the um, most obvious course, um, and I would certainly agree with you that I don't think the bill um, is compatible and therefore other people will have to decide what they do about that. The Commission can also take its own motion um, cases, but for a number of reasons which I won't trouble you with now, it's probably not as effective, certainly not as, not as um, speedy a response. The interstate case would be much faster. And there are others, I think, have already written on this um, with a lot more um, conviction than I'm able to give you today. Okay, thank you. And maybe, and I won't, you won't have time to answer this in my slot, but maybe in the other ones. Do you uh, share Amnesty International's observation that it sets a dangerous precedent internationally, uh, including by signaling other states that they too can ignore human rights obligations? But Polly. Well, certainly. Certainly doesn't certainly doesn't make us look good um, compared to all our colleagues either within the European Union or outside of it across the world, um, and particularly when the uh, revisions are being made by one of the um, actors in the conflict to which this bill is supposed to apply, um, there are very serious uh, signals being sent. I think by that 